you know, part of their magic is kind of connecting the dots that nobody else is even seeing. And that brings them to these unique and powerful insights that can really change the trajectory of an organization and allow that organization to have far more impact on far more people in the community they serve. Hey, it's Nikki Llewellyn Gregory, and you're on Gut Plus Science. You're in for a fast-paced, storytelling, action-item-rich leadership growth experience. I hope you make this podcast a habit. I consider it a leadership mentoring tool. Learning together makes us better together, and that is how we change the world around us. Let's get to it. Hey, it's Nikki back on Gut Plus Science, and today I get to lean into the way I love to live on this episode, which is find a better way. That's just like a constant for me. Find a better way. There's a better way to do this. Uh, Greg Verdino is with me today. He's the founder of Cognitive Path, uh, was highly recommended by a dear friend of mine that loves innovation and future of work type stuff. And he said, Greg is a future forward leader, is like obsessed with this stuff and is bridging the the tech, the biz, the society, all of those pieces together with the work he does. Um, his career has spanned well over 30 years from what I read and has worked with many large brands that we all know, like AT&T, Coca-Cola, Ford Motor Company, IBM, and the list goes on. Uh, go check out his LinkedIn to learn more about that. But today we are going to connect the dots on digital transformation. It is human transformation. It is one and the same. And really answering you know, the question of how AI drives human transformation towards what we're all wanting today, meaningful impact. That's the core of, of the workplace. That is what we crave. Greg, tell us why is this topic so important to you, AI driving human transformation towards meaningful impact and, and digital transformation is human transformation. Why is this topic so core to you? Sure. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, so when I think about AI, you know, clearly we're seeing artificial intelligence drive a lot of change, certainly over the course of the past couple of years since generative artificial intelligence, the flavor of AI everybody's really excited about with ChatGPT and all of its competitors, right? Uh, which is the most human-like AI that any of us has really dealt with. And I hesitate to anthropomorphize it, but it does a lot of things reasonably well that we normally think of as human tasks. It has an element of air quotes, creativity. It can write, it can create art, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I think it forces us to really think about the role of the human in the workplace. So many of the rote, routine and repeatable tasks that take up so much of our time over the course of our workday can now be automated through technology easier than ever before. And the technology is more capable than ever before. So it, it, it really forces us as leaders to think about what makes a career, what makes work impactful, worthwhile, rewarding, and meaningful to the humans in the organization. I love that. And just thinking about the tools that we get to bring to our people so that their their day flows better, like they feel more efficient, uh, you know, getting more done and just really embracing the fact that we are helping them to feel more fulfilled with the the output that they get to create is just one one angle of of that mentality. I think before we dive into you really mentoring us through like the steps of like laying a foundational effort for this in our organization and kind of framing it right, let's just like center in the consciousness of any mental shifts that you see most needed? You've, you've touched on one, like we're here to bring meaningful work and technology helps with that. But maybe what are some of those misconceptions or ways that leaders think that we just want to kind of hit on the head or challenge before we go any further? Um, I think one is the emphasis many leaders have on pure productivity as a measure of success that the more you accomplish, the more accomplished you are, right? And the reality is now that, you know, some of these tools are capable of delivering, whether it's 5%, 50%, or 10x productivity increases. And, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to hype them because the AI industry hypes them plenty, but it is undeniable that if you learn how to use these tools, you can have these incredible productivity increases so that somebody who is maybe less experienced even is able to drive a lot of productivity. 
and a smaller team is able to be as lo- as productive as a larger team. Right? There's a lot of considerations there. And when the focus is on just getting things done, we miss out on many of the opportunities that emerge where a human maybe has time to sit back and think for a change or is able to kind of rise out of the day-to-day productivity grind and be more strategic or creative or innovative, right? So, you know, for the leader, it's you kind of getting out of that productivity perspective. It's also recognizing that there are uniquely human skills that machines cannot replicate. They can't replicate now. They are unlikely to replicate even in the mid to long term. Things like empathy, understanding, um, and, you know, emotion even in a lot of ways, you know, the ability to have a connection with a customer or a colleague. And, you know, I think organizations tend to undervalue those things because you think in terms of hard skills, you're an accountant, you know how to use, how to do accounting. But if a machine can do most of the routine and repeatable tasks of the accountant, then what is the role of the actual human accountant, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where it gets down to kind of understanding the aspirations, the dreams, the hopes, the desires of the customer, let's say, and being able to figure out what the right plan is to get that consumer, that human, that person that's actually using you for accounting services to a point where they're achieving their goals. They're living their, you know, kind of they're checking off their bucket list items. They're, you know, buying the vacation home. They're getting ready for retirement, whatever. Right. So I think this sort of this shift towards human sort of human skill sets, I think, is um, another big mind shift, which is why I talk about digital transformation being human transformation having worked in digital transformation and in and around technology for most of my career, and you said 30 years, that's about right. You make me feel so old. Uh, But um, that aside, you know, so much of the emphasis when technology enters the conversation is about the bits, the bytes, the tools, the tricks, the technology. Um, And that's just as true today with artificial intelligence. But at the end of the day, it's about how this changes what we bring to the table as humans and how we are able to bring our humanity to the work we do in a way that is different from what we maybe have been able to do in the past. That is so good. And I love that you just helped me to do a reflection on myself with uh, the way I think about how AI helps me and what I love so much about it as my own individual, you know, contributor to, to the workplace I get more done. I am more efficient. And my personality is that's what I'm going for. Like that is, that's what leans into, le- you know, that's who I am. However, you know, thinking about when you went into that pro- uh, productivity being the thing that we're challenging, I tend to be that way because that's what, that that's how I'm wired. However, when we think about the other types of people, if you look at any assessment, there's usually four types of people and how they uh, need to be to, you know, the the environment that they need or the schedule they need to be their self. And so you had mentioned like creating space for people that are processors, deep thinkers, to be able to have, you know, AI to help them recap notes, build in more time in their day so that when they come to that next meeting, man, the strengths that they bring because of the time that they had to think and reflect on the depth of the notes that were there because that's their superpower on the team, right? Another one is I was thinking of a team member that's been using AI to really help her build confidence in the way that she presents herself in meetings and kind of organizing. We have a model for how we run meetings, but it's been giving her new ideas on how she comes to the table to lead a meeting. And she's been teaching us some of those things. So confidence is a huge one for her. Another is, you know, you hear people say, I'm just not the creative type. I'm just not an innovator. But with tools, you know, that there's things that get us started. And that's like, look at me. I came up with a couple of ideas today. And you hear those things. And so I love that you just challenged me because I do lean into that productivity because it's like who I am, how I'm built. I love AI for that. But there's so many other factors Before we go into, you know, kind of mentoring us on like how to lead humans through tech changes and adoption and all of that, I want to think through any other air balls with, you know, kind of how we set this up or how we frame it up. What comes to mind? Like an example of an air ball is uh, we just got the subscription for 
whatever, you know, uh, this AI tool. And it's available for all of you. Go use it. Like there's no like way of introducing it. It's just assuming that people are going to jump in. It's like there is a time it takes. What are other air balls just to be aware of before we jump in? So, um, you know, certainly you've hit on one, right, which is assuming that the availability of a tool means the adoption of a tool. And this, you know, relates to sort of the the journey organizations take into artificial intelligence or any new technology is you need to provide the right kinds of human support, the right upskilling training, so on and so forth. Even before you get into what other skills can we build outside of the technology, you know, you need to provide the right training. So, for example, if your organization adopts, let's say, ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot or any of these common tools, you know, you're going to need to teach people how to actually interact with those tools to get the best outputs. It's not natural for everybody. Um, I think the other thing that organizations tend to miss is the extent to which change is frightening to people. Um, you know, I had done a fair amount of work in the area of adaptability, both human adaptability and the adaptive organization. And, you know, adaptability is a set of skills that, or, you know, think of it as a set of muscles that can be built in many cases, right? You can strengthen these muscles, but not everybody exercises those muscles every day. Um, so a lot of people feel like they are you know, they're not prepared for change, especially when it comes to the workplace. And unfortunately, the narrative around AI in particular today is, you know, to a large extent, AI, you know, AI will take your job or somebody who knows how to use AI will take your job. So as soon as you introduce a tool into the workplace, a lot of people naturally go to that fear, uncertainty and doubt headspace. That how will this change my job in a way that I don't like, or worst of all, replace me over time? So, you know, the, you know, clear communication from leadership about why you're implementing this technology, what this means for people, what you're doing to bring people along, right? That's another potential air ball when you fail to do those things. I think also misunderstanding, not to go too technical here, because it's not, you know, this isn't a technology podcast per se, um, but assuming that buying a tool means you're doing AI. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, the tools that everyone's talking about, even the ones I just mentioned, whether it's ChatGPT or Copilot or Claude or any of these tools, are kind of like dipping a toe into the water. Uh, they can be really powerful personal productivity tools. And if you roll them across the organization, they can have great impact on the organization. But there are a number of sort of grander considerations, especially a larger organization needs to make in order to really make AI a strategic advantage. For example, what access to proprietary data do you have in your organization, data or knowledge, however you want to think about it, that can be prepared for use by an AI system that gives you, you know, that could give you a real strategic advantage relative to your competitors, or if you don't like to measure yourself against competitors relative to, you know, kind of the last best self for your organization. You know, so this idea of, you know, it's not just picking a, a tool off the shelf, but actually understanding all of the various ways technology can be used to make an organization more data-driven, more strategic, more productive, more effective, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and kind of, so another, I guess the air ball there would be limiting your thinking as a leader to, you know, this sort of, this narrow definition I think a lot of people have today about what AI actually is and how it works. Oh, there's so much to what you just shared. And I, I'm trying to figure out what would be the next best helpful place here. Uh, and I'm leaning into like foundational efforts, these, you know, the building blocks that allow us to then set the stage for this in the healthiest way that lessens the fears, lessens that frightening feeling for many and helps them have confidence around how to use it, right? And so you mentioned a couple of things in the foundational categories and then maybe you could just polish me up here. So foundational efforts like training, you know, change leadership or, you know, change management. You said communications, what are those other foundations? And then let's kind of dig on those for some best practices. So a few things. First is vision, and I'll put vision and strategy together. So I'll say vision and strategy. 
you don't start with a tool. You start with what your organization is looking to achieve. What is your strategy and how do you, how can technology, whether it's AI or anything else, um, how can technology accelerate or enhance your ability to achieve your strategic objectives? That's important because that ties to communication, right? And that also helps align your organization around the if, when, where, how, and why we're going to use a particular technology or tool. The second thing I would say is, and this is, I mean, an element of communication perhaps, but guidelines. Um, And you may remember the early days of social media, for example, when for most organizations, the social media guidelines were, thou shalt not use social media. Um, And very quickly, organizations realized that that wasn't practical and that wasn't productive, and that instead you needed to provide a set of guardrails um, that the employees of an organization could use to use social media responsibly, uh, where you would encourage active engagement and experimentation and usage, but ensure that they understood what were the walls around what they could and should say and do as it might reflect back towards the company. You know, and the same thing is true today with a technology like artificial intelligence. You know, we've worked with a number of clients uh, who you know, when we start working with them, their policy is thou shalt not use AI. And there are a lot of reasons not to use AI at work um, from a security standpoint, a bias standpoint, you know, whatever. What they find is that that stymies people's abilities to be productive, to bring their whole selves, to experiment, to feel creative in their roles. Um, and, you know, by creating what I think of as freedom in a frame, right? Don't go here. Don't go there, right? So you've got a box that you're operating in, so to speak. But all of these other things are possible. Um, So creating that kind of sort of empowering set of guidelines is a foundational element because it lets people know what they can do, what they shouldn't do, and how to kind of discern between the two. As it relates to that, as it relates to vision and strategy, even as it relates to communication, certainly, One thing I think a lot of organizations miss is the importance of bringing people into the conversation. You know, every organization, certainly organization of a given size, should have an AI council, possibly even multiple AI councils, depending on how big the organization is. That's not just the usual suspects from the C-suite. Certainly, you want those people involved, engaged, and bought into what the organization is doing, right? You can't have a CEO who says AI is someone else's job. That's where digital is someone else's job, right? Um, the CEO needs to be on board and leading that. But at the same time, you know, identify whether it's line of business heads, whether it's individual contributors with a passion for a particular technology or tool set or topic, right? Bring them in and have a cross functional multi-level, you know, however you want to think of it, council of people who regularly get together to define these key foundational elements. So it's not just the boss barking it down because that's not going to work, right? As, you know, organizations are becoming flatter, they are more participatory, they're less top down, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you have a technology or a set of technologies that can so fundamentally change the nature of the organization, you want to make sure that the people who comprise that organization have a voice in what that, you know, kind of what that change looks like. Again, I have about eight questions in my head, but before we go there, um, the first thing that came to mind when you said, and there's some organizations that they're like, the guideline is no AI. It made me think of, and I'm dating myself here, uh, being in a a classroom in school and they're like, no calculators. I still think of that. I'm like, I I don't know how to do hand math today. We all have, what is it? 98% of people that live in the United States, like uh, you have a smartphone. It's like, you know, and so just leaning into like, this is where the world is going. So I just wanted to say that. Right. And, and, you know, it's funny because I'm actually going to do a workshop with a superintendent, a statewide superintendent's organization uh, later this fall. And, you know, the same thing, you know, has come up in our conversation, has come to mind, you know, where right now educators are terrified of the implications of artificial intelligence, right? They see it as a way kids cheat on homework, and it can be. And 
before that, right, you had, I mean, the kind we think of the calculator thing, and there were news, like front page stories and, you know, major newspapers about school districts and even, I think, the Department of Education speaking out against calculators. The same was true with access to the internet. The same was true when people discovered Wikipedia, right? You know, where it was like, you know, you can't cite, there's still, I think, some colleges where, like, you can't cite Wikipedia as a source. It's like, how is that any better or worse as long as you know how to p- apply critical thinking to the information than Webster's or than the Encyclopedia Britannica, if that even exists anymore? Right? But it's the same thing over and over and over again. People, I think, naturally go towards the negative use case. And while those negative use cases exist, it's important for us to kind of look outside of that and understand, well, what is the opportunity that kind of spins out of that because you know not to you know not to go too deep into education but this applies in work as well too is you know if ai is able to provide what sounds like a factual reasonable response to a question that could for example become whether it's an essay in a high school you know let's say literature class or a blog post for your company website it then becomes incumbent on humans to really double down on our ability to think critically, to review information, put it through a critical lens, identify ways in which it might be right and ways in which it might be wrong, to identify the holes in an argument, to think about whether the you know, the argument being presented is unique enough and how can we bring our point of view to it, right? So let it do the boilerplate. But then bring our, you know, bring our insight on our ideas and our style, our voice, our substance to the article, right? Don't treat it as an end product, treat it as an input. Um, because ultimately at the at the end of the day, one way or another, the machine's not accountable, right? The human is accountable. And you need to, you know, kind of, you know, you need to bring that accountability, a level of agency, authority to the table to make sure that you're getting the best of sort of this hybrid human machine work partnership. So good. A key thing that I'm taking away today is just uh, the the core need of critical thinking applied. Uh, that is what makes this help people make sense of it. This is not a take and use as is. You've got to have that component to it. The other key that I'm taking away from you right now is like understanding how this helps people get started. A lot of what doesn't happen in this world, even get attempted in this world to better, you know, things for all of us is the the doing the thing on the list, right? And and so many times people just, they're not natural, like, I think they need a starting place. And so it helps you get started. Yeah. So thank you so much for those. I want to go back to uh, some examples around these foundational efforts. You had said, you know, the vision, let's start with the vision and strategy and then communication comes right behind that. Can you give a story or a couple of examples so that maybe someone that's listening, they're like, but what do you mean? Like, what would that vision and strategy look like? Like, what would we be communicating? Can you break that down so that somebody can understand a, an example? Let's see. So, um, you know, he, here's, you know, so, so here's an easy example. So we were working with a, the marketing department. So this wasn't corporate wide, but it was specifically the marketing department, but of a large sort of multinational manufacturing organization. And they were struggling with understanding how and why they should integrate AI into their workflows. Um, they knew they had to, they were getting pressure from other areas of the organization. They were certainly reading about everything happening in AI, but when they thought about the way they were working, the things they were doing, where and how they understood AI might be able to provide a, a positive impact for the organization, you know, they were getting stuck and where they were getting stuck, it turns out was they were starting, you know, like we've been speaking about in this, in this episode they were starting, they were thinking from the technology out. So they were saying, you know, whatever, what can chat GP2, GPT do for me? What can mid journey do for me? What can, and it was becoming very sort of micro task oriented. And that was causing them to lose sight of the big picture. And it, it simply, I mean, this doesn't, it's not rocket science. It simply took them sort of sitting down as a team 
and thinking, no, no, no. What are you trying to achieve as an organization? What has the organization, the larger organization, tasked you with? What are your key objectives? Um, now, when you start from that bigger picture, what are the ways in which artificial intelligence can help you optimize, you know, at a minimum, extend or expand, right? Do more, do better, do different, or innovate. Do the things you can't do or won't do, or you know, be with your current, you know, set of you know skills, capabilities, technologies, tools, whatever. You know, so it became, you know, sort of an exercise where they articulated, okay, this is our core strategy, which, you know, which is built around delivering against these key objectives. And here is the role AI plays in helping us to achieve that. You know, and it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's not rocket science, as I said, it sounds relatively simple, but it's something that is, I, you know, very, you know, absolutely foundational and gets lost when we start to think about the shiny, shiny thing that's out there that everyone's doing, you know, and that it's an easy tool to adopt, but, you know, but what does it really mean? <laughs> yeah. Yep. The why behind it. Yeah. Just in clearly articulating that over and over and over again. Right. right. It's and that gives you a bit of a North star because now you can say, I can use the technology to do a, does that achieve my objectives? Does that ladder up to my strategy? Or I could use it to do B, does that achieve my objectives? Does that ladder up to my strategy? And you know, another example, um, I, I was recently working with a small healthcare strategy consultancy. And one of the things that makes them uniquely different from so many of their competitors is that they you know, they're not just good consultants, um, but they actually, like, they live and breathe the space they work in. And they work with a lot of human services organizations, you know. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, you know, nuance in the work they do with their clients. And they have a very rigorous approach to gathering stakeholder feedback, not just from the client themselves, but from the client's clients and even from people living in the community that are impacted by the services these organizations deliver. And, you know, part of their magic is kind of connecting the dots that nobody else is even seeing. And that brings them to these unique and powerful insights that can really change the trajectory of an organization and allow that organization to have far more impact on far more people in the community they serve. So that was a long way of kind of laying that out. But what they learned very quickly was that when they use AI as a substitute for that dot connecting to bring the insights to the table, it might be effective. However, it makes the consultants feel more disconnected from the work and the data. So, you know, there was a, you know, they, they very quickly came to this clear sense that as an organization, even if it made them more productive, they were never going to allow technology to do that, what they see as very human work. They might use technology to then write up those insights, or they might use AI to summarize things, or they might use AI to help with an outline or a draft or whatever, but they would never allow it to do the work of insight generation. And making those kinds of decisions is key. Because in you know at the end of the day, if there's something that makes your your organization unique and different from the other organizations in your space, if you use technology to automate it, you effectively run the risk of becoming just like everybody else in your space that has access to that very same technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so much there. I, I have a feeling that you're going to get hit up a lot for questions after this. Like I I have so many, and I know I I can't ask them all, but Couple, couple other things. One, as you were talking about, like the insights generation, you know, of new ideas, and like we're not going to allow this to do this. What I have found in my use with AI, I'm also making a list of all the things I'm doing terribly, by the way, that I need to fix, uh, particularly in leading a team. So thank you, shining a bright light there. But the way that I use it, what I have found is the the more that I get specific with what I know, which is already my way of, of doing what I do. When I ask for help very, very specifically, the answer I'm getting is directly aligned to like what I'm typing in. Just like when we, we all learned how to use Boolean search, 
right? When you learn how to use the right words, you're, the way that you search, you're going to get based on your strategy of searching. And I feel like I'm pretty darn good at that still today. People will be like, how'd you find that? I'm like, I know the right way to type in whatever to search to find things. But then in like insights generation, I think sometimes people think, I'm just going to, I'll say this in an extreme way, write this boring question, right? Like, Versus really thinking about the question with the very specifics. And I need this in five steps and I need it to come from the angle of innovation. And I need there to be research backing in that. And it's like your input will be equivalent to your output in some ways, right? It's really Absolutely. important well, to think that. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out. And, you know, the fact that these tools, the AI tools we're working with today are such confident liars <laughs> right. The challenge with that is, um, and I don't know, you know, I know this is not a show for children, but, you know, I don't know what your language ratings are. But I often say if it, if you suck, it might make you suck less or it's not going to turn you into a superhuman. Right. And where these tools really come to come alive, I think, in a in a business scenario, certainly is when you are expert in something and you know how to bring your expertise to the table, like you're describing in the form of knowing what questions to ask, why you're asking those questions, framing them the right way, being able to then apply a critical lens to what you get back in return and say, no, this isn't right, but that's pretty good. That's really where these tools, I think, deliver a lot of their greatest value. And, you know, I think, you know, not to go into a, into a rabbit hole on this, but, you know, I think naturally, given what we do for a living, I would say eight times out of 10, certainly for me personally, I'm using a writing assistant like a chat GPT or a Claude or whatever. But, you know, kind of take yourself out of writing and think about the other things these tools can do. They can produce computer code, right? And, you know, I, I might ask it to develop code for whether it's a website or a piece of software, I would have no idea if that's good code or bad code, but an expert coder would. Or I can, as an artist, ask Midjourney or Dolly or you know Firefly by Adobe to generate, let's say, a photorealistic image of X, Y, or Z. But if I'm a photographer, I'll know enough to say, shot with this kind of lens on this kind of camera at this kind of, you know, this time of day to get exactly what I want. Right. So it's, you know, it's, it's important to think about what expertise do you as a human bring to the table and how does that expertise provide you with an advantage in how you leverage these tools? Yeah. I'll give you a real quick example in case this is helpful for listeners and feel free to give me feedback. Um, Last night, I was working on a better way. Hey, going back into our TF, I was like, I got to talk about what I love. A better way to help anyone on our team run an onboarding call for a new client. So when we we have a new client, we do we are specialist in B two B podcast outcomes, like business outcomes. So like monetization, relationship building, things like that. So the way that we do our onboarding calls, we get compliments many times on like, gosh, that just really made me think. Like, it's a really different, it's not a templated like onboarding. It is a very strategy heavy meeting. And so I typed in to, uh, I forget what I was using last night, one of my tools. Um, here are the outcomes that I need, I want at the end of our onboarding meeting. Here is what we teach in the meeting. Can you create a workbook is a homework before before the meeting so that like anybody on our team can really be the facilitator rather than a lot of times when I'm doing those, I'm like, I'm coaching through it. I need the workbook to really be the coach. They're doing all of this. And then I have a facilitator that's capturing everything, recording that, transcribing, you know, all of that. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this workbook, this is gonna, this is called scalability and onboarding, right? I was so excited about it. So just just an example of like, it could never create the workbook unless I told it the outcomes and the way that we think about onboarding and the key teachings, right? But the workbook was pretty darn solid. I can't wait to go try it. So, yeah. And when you, you know, that's another great example of you know, a really interesting use case, right? You know, that you've got this process that is repeatable, but maybe not as scalable as you would like it to be. It's a well documented process. I'm sure you know exactly how it runs. 
you've proven it, you've taken the kinks out of it so that it actually works. Um, you know what your outcomes are. And when you can effectively train an AI using that data, right, that well-defined process, the clear outcomes and so on and so forth, you have a much better job of getting what you're looking for. But, you know, as importantly, you create an opportunity to make a something that you have your personal knowledge of into something that becomes institutional knowledge that is now scalable. Right. And I think it's interesting because there's a lot of there's almost a fork in the road. A lot of organizations are at right now where we run the risk of sort of talent collapse or talent pipeline collapse. And what I mean by that is, you know, as a leader, I might think, you know, my middle level skilled employees can use artificial intelligence to do the thing that yesterday an entry-level employee might have done or an intern might have done. Um, and that's expensive to me as a leader. So I'm going to eliminate all those junior people and have my mid-level employees or my senior-level employees use AI to do those routine tasks. But now you lose this environment in which the junior people learn the skills they need to rise up and become mid and senior level employees, right? Um, and that's happening. There are, you know, law firms who are trying to replace paralegals with AI. There's, you know, examples of, you know, Klarna is the one who's been most public about this, where they're firing marketers, they're firing salespeople, they're firing customer service reps and replacing them all with AI agents. And it's like, well, what happens when you need your next senior level marketer or your next super skilled sales rep? or someone who's capable of addressing a highly charged, really nuanced customer service problem, because your chatbot ain't going to do that. You know, so there is that risk when organizations think that this is pure efficiency, cut down the head count, make it all about machines, you know, but what you're describing kind of goes the other direction. That's the other path, right? Which is how do I take junior people and level them up? and give them the tools to do more and do things better and be more effective than they had been. And at the same time, free yourself up, I'm sure, to do things that are more strategic and more interesting for you. You know, what's just coming to mind as we close up this conversation is how important it is as an organization to know who you are. You have to know who you are and yeah, you know, the way in which you show up. Um, I am a high touch relationship building company. It's what relationships are. It's the top core value that we have, right? We also have innovation as one of our core values. But just knowing who you are helps to guide the decisions around like when you're talking about not allowing AI to do insights generation. It depends on who you are, right? And how you do that, right? And so uh, I think the challenge is like, yeah, we got to know that first before that vision and strategy and then the training and the guidelines and leading through change and the communications, right? And and I know you help people with all that stuff, but I, I'm working on myself through through this learning and I, th I've i loved this conversation. So Yeah. And I think, you know, your insight is spot on, right? And that, I guess, gets back to this idea of vision, right? Whether it's vision, mission, purpose, et cetera, is knowing who you are as an organization because who you are as an organization doesn't and shouldn't change just because you've got to introduce, you know, you've introduced a new technology tool into the mix, you know? So for the example I shared about that healthcare consultancy where this sort of human angle on insights was something that differentiated them, I might think of, let's say, I don't know, an ad agency where for better or for worse, clients don't like to pay for insights and strategy. They like to pay for execution. And, you know, the creative director is under the gun to produce something, you know, over, practically overnight. And you need a quick insight so that you can get into creative ideation, right? You know, that might be you. So you might make the exact opposite decision and say, we're going to use AI to surface an insight faster than we can do it as humans. Because at the end of the day, the client's paying us for the idea, not the insight. You know, and that's a perfectly valid decision if that's your business. If that's your business, right? right? Knowing who you are. Yeah. All rooted in, in you know, who you are and your why and all that. So, so much good here. Uh, so, Greg, your podcast, the No Brainer podcast, it's 
central around AI. You can continue this conversation and learning from Greg. Go follow the No Brainer podcast. Go follow Greg on LinkedIn. Hit him up. Uh, share the, I hope you don't have as many questions as I do, or Greg is going to be real busy with that LinkedIn inbox. Maybe I should go find an episode first so that I could uh, best maximize your time. But thank you. I am so always much. happy, always happy to connect with anybody and to answer any questions. Oh, well, thank you so much. Before we go, we always ask, we have for nearly seven years, your favorite book of all time or favorite recent read uh, that applies to just the, the leadership journey in your life or becoming a better human? Sure. So interestingly enough, um, given everything we've been talking about, I mean, there's many, many books I've read, obviously, over the course of my career. But the one that comes to mind is a book called Team Human by Douglas Rushkoff. And it's not a leadership book. Um, it's barely a business book, uh, but it is about the many ways that technology and humanity intersect. And it is an impassioned plea, let's say, for uh, for keeping humanity in the driver's seat. Um, if you don't know, or if your listeners don't know, Doug Rushkoff, he kind of came out of the early internet scene. He was kind of like a cyberpunk kind of dude. Um, he's a professor in media studies at CUNY here in New York. Super brilliant guy and does a lot of really smart, critical thinking about technology and humanity and how they either work together or work against one another, depending on how we choose to apply them. So given our topic today, I think it's a nice, relevant read. Totally. Yeah. I've got it on my list now. I've never heard of that book before, but yeah, Team Human. Here we go. So a little fun fact about Greg. Greg, if you want to elaborate just real quickly, because I know we got to wrap up, but, um, you know, I hear uh, that you spent time representing Ice Ice Baby uh, in a digital means. For those of you that are old enough to remember, like Vanilla Ice, Ice Ice Baby. Uh, so there's a day in your life where you were acting as uh, as Vanilla Ice? I, I was Ice, I suppose. Yeah, that, um, so... Not long after I graduated college, a friend of mine worked at the record label that had signed Vanilla Ice, um, and he, of course, blew up with Ice Ice Baby and was getting a lot of fan mail from largely younger fans, you know, little kids like, Mr. Ice, what's your favorite movie? What did you have for dinner yesterday? I love Blue. Do you love Blue? And, you know, it's probably no secret that not every celebrity has the time to answer every piece of fan mail. So I just happened to be hanging out with my friend who was at the record label. And he's like, here's a stack of mail. Do you want to answer some of them? You know, so I was sitting there going, my favorite, you know, food is pizza, you know, or whatever. Um, it was an interesting, I felt dishonest, <laughs> but at the same time, it was an interesting uh Interesting way to spend an afternoon, and I guess I can now, many, many years later, that say that for just one day, I was Vanilla Ice. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm going to tie it to something that I think is just a great inspirational reminder. Greg, the day that you woke up on that day that we're talking about when you got to be Vanilla Ice for the day or the afternoon, you didn't wake up knowing you were going to do that. It Absolutely crossed your path <laughs> that day, right? It's like, and we're here telling the story I'm sure it's years later, right? Like I know, you know, it's so many, many years. Just with like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like just for for some people out there, I think it's a first of all, it's a cool fun fact, and that we were cracking up as we talked right before we recorded. But just you know, to embrace opportunity, I think today's topic is so much about opportunity, and you know, just trying it, seizing it. And and a lot of times like these things fall in our laps and even, you know, this cool little uh, side hustle that you got to do with Vanilla Ice, you didn't wake up even knowing you're going to do that that day. And we're telling the story years later and it's making people laugh. Like, so, hey, just uh, sometimes we all need to be recentered and grounded in some of those little lessons. Um, this has been amazing. Uh, Greg, I just want to make sure, I think you had like a resource library or something to point people to before we go. So, oh, I've got so many things. I mean, please feel free to connect with me if you have any questions. Greg Verdino on LinkedIn, you can find me. You mentioned already, Nikki, obviously the podcast. We're at episode 40 now. I don't know if that's good or bad, but we're 40 episodes in. Um, and that's nobrainerpodcast.com. Also, Cognitive Path, my consultancy publishes a sub stack where we've got hundreds of articles that go back many, many years, long before anyone else was talking about AI. And that's at thecognitivepath.substack.com. And then also folks can learn more about me at gregberdino.com. And then I'll stop sharing URLs.
Greg, thank you for such an inspiring conversation and helping me think about AI in a different way. Leaning into this topic area of digital transformation is human transformation. So my truth you can act on, number one, transforming my mindset on the reframe that Greg challenged, which is stop thinking of AI just as getting things done. We all have different ways uh, of being, you know, different personality and behavioral ways. And I do tend to lean into that AI helps me get things done. However, there's so many different angles to thinking about AI creating space in our lives, to have more white space on our calendar, to automate things that, you know, create such a long to-do list that help us to streamline that stuff, to help us build more of a creative innovation muscle. The list is endless, and we have to reframe the core of AI being getting things done. Thank you so much, Greg, for challenging me on that. The second thing is training is so foundational. It's kind of like communication when we say you have to say it again and again and again and repeat and reiterate the core message. Training is very similar in AI. It's like, it's not just, oh, hey, check out this two-minute video tutorial. It is a really in-depth experience to understand how to use this particular AI in a role and train people well. I think training is often overlooked and it is a very foundational component to all of this. And my third truth you can act on is it all goes back to, as most everything does, but reminder in your AI initiatives and technology initiatives, it goes back to knowing who you are as an organization and knowing your, you know, vision, your mission, your values, and really tying it into those foundational efforts rather than, hey, we heard what the next door neighbor company is doing with AI and we're just going to adopt that. You really have to go from the roots and create your digital, you know, transformation or tech experiences to match who you are as an organization going back to the very basic, your foundational stuff. Greg, Thank you so much. Can't wait to check out your podcast, The No Brainer Podcast, and learn a lot more just about how to transform a lot of my thinking around AI and how our team best adopts it. Really appreciate you. See y'all next time. We just left the world a little bit better. Now, go do something with it.